Um, so I kind of have this idea that plants, like people, have an immune system and that, that they have a resistance to things like pests. Um, but if they're weak, the pests will have at them. Uh, and you see that, we, I see that in the field because often the ends of my beds, the far ends, are the part where the pests do the most damage. Now part of that is the pressure coming from outside the field, but part of it is that the, the, the ones, the plants that are growing at the ends of the beds are always the weakest because they get trampled as you walk, you know, cut the corners with the tractor, or they don't get weeded as well, or they don't get watered as well because they're at the edge of the irrigation set. So those plants are weaker to begin with. And then that weakness translates into them having more pressure from pests. Huh, as interesting. Well. I got that from a, one of my teachers who, who was really into the whole immune system and human beings, and, and he kind of had this idea that plants have Im immunities, and when they're weak, they... And you definitely see that as plants start to decline, the pests kind of will move in. Um, you know, the other thing, big thing that we're doing out here for pests really is not monocropping. Um, you know, I do have some crops like corn, maybe we'll have a quarter acre of it. But for the most part, you know, what you see is a little patch of this, a row of that. You see some flowers out in the middle of the field that are, that are mostly just grown for, for the birds that like them. Um, I grow, there's a couple of crops that I grow, like dill and cilantro, that uh, I will let go to flower, and those flowers will attract beneficial insects. Okay. Um, but the big thing about having the diversity is just that you're... Um, you're reducing the habitat for the for the bad insects for, for your pests. So if you have a you know ten acres of corn and then you have a pest that likes corn, they're just going to flourish in there and go crazy in your corn. But if you just have a little patch and then you have something else and you have something else, that there's different pests that like each dif different crop. So you're sort of giving them less territory to, to move in on. Um, and at least in our climate, a lot of the pests actually they they immigrate in each year. They don't overwinter here, so each year they have to come find you. And if you've just got a little bit of this and a little bit of that, it's harder for them to find you. Very um, nice. Yeah. And then, of course, you're also you're, you're putting yourself at less risk in terms of failure. If you have one crop that fails out of 25 crops that you're growing, it's not as much of a problem as if you're just growing two crops and you lose one of them. So that's another way that diversity helps. So it sounds like diversity is a big part of your strategy all the way around. It is. It is. And also for nutrients, for pests for diseases, soil diseases. Um, so diversity also plays into rotation where you're not growing the same crop in the same land over and over again each year. Um, and when you grow the same crop in the same soils, um, you run into two problems. One is the crop uses the same nutrients and it needs the same fertilizers each year. So it's going to keep sucking that out of the soil. And the second thing is it's gonna, the diseases, the diseases do overwinter in our soil. So if you get some kind of a fungus disease, that's affecting your tomatoes, and then you keep planting tomatoes in that same soil, you're going to have that same disease. Um, so in that case, we're trying to rotate different plants, and, and we're talking about the different plant families. So tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, and potatoes are all in the same plant family. So they'll, they're in the Solanaceae family, and they will all, because they're in the same family, that means they're going to have the same nutrients that they need and draw from the soil. They're going to have the same pests. They're going to have the same diseases. So for that reason, those crops, I would never plant them in the same spot in the following year. The year. That makes so sense. if I had eggplants in a spot the following year, you know, none of those crops could go in. And there's really only like five families of food that we grow for almost all of our food, for, for the vegetables anyway. There's, you know, the Solanaceae, which I just mentioned. There's the Curcubins, which is like uh, cauliflower, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, cucumber, squash, winter squash, those are all curcubits, pumpkins. There's different subspecies, but they're all related, they all have the same pests, same diseases, same nutrient needs. And there's the cruciferciae, which is like the, or brassica, brassicas, they're called broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, all those are in that same family. Um, let's see. What other vegetable crops are there? There's the alliums, which is like the onions, the uh, garlic, um, shallots, leeks, all those other oniony things. Stronger smelling root crops. Yeah, that was three plant families. I'm, I'm, 
I'm probably forgetting. Okay, so the lettuces are all in one family, but I can't remember what the name of that family is. Um, I'll have to go look. I've got a book that's a little more of a guide that, that would give us, like, all the information. But but the idea is that, each you know, there really aren't that many different plant families that we have. I think it's just five that we grow vegetables in. And that each one of those plant families, as you get to know them as a farmer, they, they really are this very similar. You know, broccoli grows very similar to cauliflower. They like the same conditions. They use the same nutrients, same pests, same diseases. So really that plays into a lot. The diversity is also about rotating and, and, and having all those things kind of mixing up um, each year. Very nice. Okay. <laughs> no, this is good. This is exactly what we need. Um, you know, the other thing we do for pests is we use these, this remade material. You know, that's going to be hard to come by in, in a you know, a place where you can't just order stuff through the mail. But that is a like a fabric. It's probably something they could make very similar. But, like, we have problems with a certain pest that gets on our soft-leafed, uh, like the tatsoys and the bok choys and stuff. It's the flea beetle. We'll just eat those up. So we cover those crops with this very thin kind of fabric. It's an agricultural fabric called rime. And it allows the air and the water and the sunlight to penetrate, but it doesn't let the bugs get through. Okay. Do you have some of that around? We can look yeah, at. Yeah, we can look at a piece of that. And we think you know, like, it's very similar to like what a very fine like muslin cloth, like a cheese cloth. Okay. So it's probably something people have seen, but you know maybe that it's not very accessible. But it's, it's like amazingly effective. It's you know the barrier method. It's just amazing. You just cover something, and you have to be a little careful because if you've got fruits in there that you. Pollinated, you're keeping your pollinators away too. Okay. Um, so you, you, know, you need to have bees that, that are going to spread the pollen that you can't keep them covered with pollen. Um, but if you're not worried about it, if you're just growing a leafy crop where you don't need where there's no fruits, then you don't have to worry about that. And the beetles don't crawl around the fabric or something. Yeah, I mean, like I that. pin it down, but these flea beetles actually they, they move by hopping. Okay. So they don't really crawl. Huh. Uh, and there's some that get under there anyway, and there's some under there before you start, um, but it's just much, much less. Okay. Yeah. So that's what it sounds like, is that you're never going to eliminate your pests on an organic farm. Right. But doing everything you can to interrupt their life cycle. Yep. Yep. And, you know, people, some people are, you know, we, we have the benefit of, of growing in a desert climate. So we don't really have the kinds of pest pressures that some people have. Um, but like our, our organic fruit tree growers, the apple growers, they have to spray really regularly to keep the coddling moss from moving in. And they're spraying some kind of an oil that has some kind of a plant extract in it that's toxic to those bugs, you know. Okay. And it's organic because it's made with organic source materials, but it's still sort of very intensive. It requires a lot of intervention. Yep. Mostly what I'm doing is doesn't require a lot of intervention. I'm mostly succeeding by the diversity, like I mentioned, and volume, and also choosing it to grow here where there's not a lot of pests. <laughs> very nice. Yeah. I'll keep walking a little bit. Um, let's see. Do you bring in beneficial insects? You know, I have before, um, but for the most part, I've kind of stopped doing that. Um, it's really most effective when you, when you're in like a greenhouse and you can keep them from flying away. Um, you know, and, and they do sell, like you can get these bags of ladybugs and you go and you spread them and they're, they're ravenous when they come and... And then you just watch them go to work. But usually a few days later, they're kind of gone. Okay. They kind of move on unless there's something great about it. And I, most of what I try to do is just, again, create that habitat for them. So, like, I grow these breaks of dill and cilantro, and the, and the ladybugs are drawn to that. And then they'll they'll go out and find other food. Okay. So dill and cilantro are your big favorites for attracting. They're my big favorites. They're, they're in the Umbrophilarae family. That was one of the family we didn't talk about. The carrots are in that family. Um what else is in that family? Um, Umble filarae. It's um, and and uh, they make they all make a similar kind of flower. That's it's like an umbrella. That's okay. where um, umble comes from. And uh, it, and those flower heads, we can actually. Oh, I'll show you some here. Those flower heads are what's very attractive to the beneficial insects. We'll have lace wings on them. And lace bugs. That's still. Okay. 
And that's the classic Umbel family. So there's quite a few plants that have that same shaped. Sometimes they're white, sometimes they're yellow, but they always have that kind of open up in a in a big head like that. These are potatoes here. Okay. And do you plant the dill in with other crops directly? No, it's usually on its own, but what happens is it goes to seed every year. Okay. So every year it kind of just comes up wherever it and if I don't weed it out, then it's then it's there. Okay. Um, in this case, I, I specifically left this. Uh, I, I mowed over the tops of most of this potatoes to knock the weeds down, but I didn't mow this because I knew people would want dill for their pickling projects. I see. So, and it was like the only dill I had left in the field. Ah, nice. That I mean, worked there's, out. There's some more, but these were some big heads at the time. What do we have growing over here? This is uh, cauliflower. This is some of that crazy purple cauliflower. Oh, nice. A couple heads that didn't get picked in there. Yeah. Um, that was a green cauliflower we did this year. And we grew the orange cauliflower and, of course, the white cauliflower. Um, that kind of diversity is more just about people enjoying the different colors than, than uh, anything else. Because okay. they're all in the same plant family. They all have the same needs and everything. Yep. Um, cabbages in here. Uh, you can see our sprinkler line. Things like broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower all like water. They like to be watered all day long, every day. So you can water them in the heat of the summer here. You'll always see these uh, sections on. The sprinklers are on here. So that's one other thing that happens that works against the, the diversifying theory is that because of my different irrigation needs, I've got to kind of clump things together that want the same kind of irrigation. Okay. Um, so I'll clump together these brassicas, even though ideally maybe they would be more separated. You know, there are, these aren't all the um, brassicas that I have. There's some over there, and there's some out there, so it's not like the whole thing, but there's a big clump of them here, and that's for a reason, because they all like to get watered all the time. And that's probably your most water-intensive type of crop. Mm -hmm. That and like lettuces get watered a lot. Um, whereas something like a tomato or a squash maybe would prefer if you, if you didn't water it as much, likes to dry out really between waterings. Um, at the end of the year, people often will just stop irrigating those crops and just let them dry. Okay. So they'll ripen up their fruits more. I see. This is all sort of fallow, but it was it was planted in crops this year, and then it's just been dug up, and I haven't had a chance to till it down yet. Nice. We've got a lot of rocks in our soil. That uh, is always a lot of work on your equipment, and uh, it's a big project in the spring, but the rocks also indicate that we have good mineral content in our soil, because our soils are being formed when there's a lot of volcanic activity in the area. And amazingly enough, if you go down to Hanson Mesa, one mesa below us, there are no rocks. <laughs> no rocks. Like, none. <laughs> like, if they want rocks, they have to come up here and get them. And, uh, you know, around here, you see, uh, you can't quite see them, but there's rock walls on the edge of every field because people have been pulling rocks out for a hundred years. And they're not done. You know, there's still more rocks. Um, and so you've got a much better mineral content than they do down in Hanson Mesa. Yes. Their soil is sandier. Yeah, so they have more work to do in terms of fertility. Okay. So, but I just, no, I just noticed the rocks, that's why I mentioned it. Yep. Because every time you till, you get a bunch of rocks coming 